In September 11th, 2004, Kids WB aired the first episode of their almost exclusive Batman cartoon simply titled The Batman. This was 14 years before Ben Affleck decided to use that name for his standalone Batman movie in the DCEU, set between Zack Snyder's Justice League movies that never got made. And 16 to 18 years before Matt Reeves appropriated it for the movie he made in 2022 starring Robert Pattinson. The cartoon was set on the third year of Batman's crime-fighting career, where he was still hunted down by the not-corrupt Gotham City Police Department for being an illegal vigilante, and when he would first start facing off against his classic villains like the Joker, Penguin and the Riddler, but not Two-Face or Scarecrow because of a haistaka vittu reason called the Bat Embargo. Even before we ended up with the current problems with the Warner Bros. today, it was a complete haistaka vittu situation, where Warner Bros. wouldn't let this cartoon use villains reserved for Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight trilogy movies, and not let the DC Animated Universe's Justice League Unlimited cartoon use any Bat family members, because they thought we were too dumb to know the difference of different versions of those characters actors appearing in different shows. Meaning that even Robin couldn't appear in this cartoon until the Teen Titans cartoon I never watched ended. It is a vitumoinen paskarinki we are stuck in, because nowadays that is not a problem anymore, but the quality of shows like this and the DCAU is not used anymore, and we only have that Harley Quinn cartoon trying to emulate Rick and Morty. That Batman Cape Crusader cartoon has been in development hell for who knows how long. That Superman cartoon is a rehash of better things done before, and I don't even dare to compare them to Invincible. But enough ranting about that, you open this video to see a review on the direct-to-video tie-in movie set during the second season of the Batman cartoon, where he fought Dracula as an inspired adaptation of the Batman Vampire trilogy I made my previous video on. It seems kind of fitting that it was made with this cartoon as Batman in it was somewhat close to the same point of his career as the one in the comic, but since this was a tie-in movie of a Saturday morning cartoon, the best the movie was able to push for was TV PG rating, which meant that kids under the age of 10 can only watch it with their parents. The main cartoon on itself was more or less rated for 8-year-olds, and I was 12 when it first aired. That pretty much goes to say that if it was a main character from the cartoon, they would survive whatever happens to them. But for those instances we have that age-old saying, there are worse fates than death. Okay, this opening is long enough for the relevant and irrelevant information, so I might as well move on to the plot commentary. Okay, let's get the obvious parts out of the way first. Dracula does not randomly pass through Gotham, like in the comic, but instead he was transferred there centuries ago after probably Abraham Van Helsing managed to stake him. He was awoken from his slumber when the Penguin stumbled onto his crypt while looking for a hidden loot of stolen money, and is then turned into Dracula's human servant because... I will require a human servant, a sentinel. God, my coffin while I sleep. And another difference is that the people in Gotham become more aware of Dracula's presence when his victims end up being random people, instead of the society's undesirables that no one would miss. That was probably done to keep the younger audiences from learning of such a concept until they would have grown up to be older as well as to hammer it home more that Batman in this series was still an illegal vigilante hunted down by the police. Also, as Commissioner Gordon was not introduced until the end of the second season, aka after the events of this movie, he was naturally adapted out of it along with Tanya. 
and the vampire Batman only appears in a nightmare dream sequence Bruce has after his first confrontation with Dracula. Speaking of Bruce actually, that side of his identity is given more presence in this movie, and in the end, it ends up being one of Bruce Wayne's accomplishments that helped Batman defeat Dracula. His social life also gets a bone thrown at it, with the movie having a rare case of a redhead version of Vicky Vale in it, for Bruce to feel sorry about avoiding while he is busy being Batman, and to serve as the damsel in distress in the end. Other similar scenes that were probably inspired by the comic trilogy I could point out are... How Batman first comes across the vampire ghouls attacking civilians and their victims rising as them. The difference is that Batman is the one who has to flee from them instead of the other way around. Then, there is the first confrontation Batman has with Dracula after fleeing away from SWAT officers thinking he is the vampire, and they are clearly given shoot to kill orders. Dracula follows the pursuit in also turning Batman's pursuers into his slaves, likely as an act of good faith because he is intrigued in Batman coming across to him as his inspired successor. Man who dresses like a bat. My legacy has been quite influential. Rare instances have been documented of a man who assumes the likeness of a bat in societies ancient as well as modern. And I believe that while instilling fear by night, these beings cloak themselves as normal members of society. The legend you are apparently intimate with. Don't flatter yourself. We cast kindred shadows. Have you not seen the news? When Batman then straight up tells Dracula he is not interested, he gets overpowered only to be saved by the rising sun, similarly as what happened in Red Rain, but without an unconfirmed how long standstill with a blood drawn cross. Then there is an aspect I assume would make Dog Monk proud, where Batman and Alfred manage to create an antidote to vampirism similar to Tanya's blood substitute, by having the movie view vampirism similarly as bloodborne diseases that can be cured. It is a semi-long process with trial and error, but still a perfect cure that even leaves Dracula's victims free from the memory of their time as vampiric ghouls. But not Dracula himself. <laughs> you may have cured my human victims of their disease, but no earthly medicine can cure a supernatural affliction. They managed to do it by using the Joker who was turned into a vampire too, unlike in the comic, as a guinea pig. And I should also mention that when Batman catches the vampire Joker in a blood bank, they both end up causing who knows how many deaths by wasting so much blood that could be needed by hospitals with patients who require blood transfusions. Oh, and the vampire joker definitely killed this one clerk at the blood bank. You wanna get blood? I like it. That is probably the only actual death that happens here, because Dracula just keeps turning everyone he beat into his servants. If only because I really hate to waste a life when it can be spent in servitude. Life or living death. And the final aspects that were used from the comic is how Batman ends up luring Dracula through a series of underground tunnels to the Batcave. Similarly as how he lured Dracula's family of vampires there to fight Tanya and her vampires before blowing up the cave roof to let the sun shine onto them. Except here, Batman uses a Chekhov's gun established earlier in the movie as a prototype solar energy storing machine, and uses the sunlight stored in it to burn Dracula into ashes to be dusted out by Alfred, which I suppose is a more child-friendly way of killing an undead vampire then stabbing him with a sharp wooden object. And with the similarities out of the way, next let's talk about some other things I found worth talking about. Like for example, did you know that this movie decided to make Dracula's original pride to have been Countess Carmilla Karnstein? Carmilla Karnstein, bride of Count Dracula. According to legend, her bloodthirst rivaled even his own. Seems they were meant for each other. Cupid's arrow could penetrate a heart so black. There may be hope for you yet, Master Bruce. Who not only predates Dracula's existence by 26 years, in having been created in 1872 by Sheridan Le Fanu, and happens to be a prototypical example of a lesbian vampire. 
Wikipedia existed back in 2005 when this movie was being made, and apparently the writer Dwayne Capizzi didn't catch that up when he did his research onto the vampiric lore. Anyway, Dracula plans to resurrect Carmilla with Vicky Vale's life essence, which is how she ends up as the damsel in distress in the end. Pretty much because he ended up creeping on her earlier in the movie, in a way that's okay for a kids show movie, and I suppose because redheads just happen to be Dracula's style. Also, for a kids show movie, the director Michael Hoguen managed to go around certain corners when it came to the horror aspects of this vampire movie. For example, Dracula and his turned victims definitely bite their victims to their necks, but due to the TVBG rating could only show the setup and the aftermath of the act without showing the act itself happening. That is why the camera always ended up cutting away from the gore to the people witnessing it, like to the Penguin and Batman. And in this one instance, the movie uses a broken bottle of wine as a substitute for blood pouring when Dracula claims on another victim. The only time when it's almost directly shown is after Batman has refused to join Dracula's family and is about to be bitten before the sunrise saves his life. Then the cast of the film was mostly the original voice actors from the cartoon, with Rino Romano as Batman and Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne? I don't believe we've met. Count Dracula, I presume. Kevin Michael Richardson as the Joker. Goodbye, Arkham! Hello, Gotham! Tom Kenny as the Penguin. Tweet, tweet. I'm Penguin, I'll be your server. And Alistair Duncan as Alfred. You there, more napkins at the buffet. You attend to the spill in the study, and you, Stipes, huh? do you mind tucking in your shirt? As newcomers, Dracula himself was voiced by Swedish actor Peter Stormare, whom I know from his role as John Abruzzi in Prison Break, Lucifer from the 2005 Constantine movie, and that imaginary psychiatrist in Until Dawn. For some reason he still felt somewhat restrained when compared to those latter two examples. Even her name possesses a mysterious allure. Can be, if I want. God has given me the chance to choose. Thank you for keeping my legacy alive in my absence. But now there is only room for one Batman in Gotham. You're the one soul I would come up here to collect myself. So I've heard. Very fitting, John. I didn't think you would make the same mistake twice. I am beyond human, Batman. I am evil incarnate. I am the Prince of... Darkness? You see, no one can change what happened last year. The past is beyond our control. You have to accept this in order to move forward. But there is freedom in this revelation. Everything you do, every decision you make from now on will open doors to the future. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember this as you play your game. Every single choice will affect your fate and the fate of those around you. And Vicky Vale was voiced by Tara Strong, whom we all know used to voice Batgirl in the DCAU and the Killing Joke movie before she was made to be one of the most overacted boys for Harley Quinn. Tons of money. If only I were shallow. There's something deeper bubbling below your surface. And that is probably all I can say about this movie anymore. Outside of the fact that it was apparently supposed to get a sequel based on the Hush storyline at some point before getting cancelled. I should also probably bring up that there are, or were, two unofficial movies, with Batman fighting Dracula, with Batman Dracula made in 1964 by Andy Warhol, and in 1967 there was a Filipino-made Batman fights Dracula film. Both have unfortunately by now been lost to time, and we only have these posters to give us some kind of idea on what kind of movies they were. But to give the Batman vs. Dracula some kind of final verdict, 
I recognize what it was made to be and acknowledge that it took what it could to be inspired by the Batman Vampire trilogy before the censors naturally told it to go back to being rated for fourth grade elementary schoolers. Okay, and the next comic to adaptation comparison review in proper will be on Flashpoint, which will be the third time I'm making a video on it. Fourth, if you count my Pika review on the Flash movie. Until that project gets anywhere, feel free to like this video, comment whatever you have to say about this movie and the cartoon it spawned out of, share the video for other people to see, and subscribe for my other videos. Also, ding the bell to be alerted when I do gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.